Thank you. I've enjoyed the music very, very much. Boy, that offertory was terrific, brother. God bless you. I am grateful to be here today and thanking the Lord for His goodness and His grace. I do want to again thank you for the accommodations last night, and somebody must have known what I liked by way of healthy food, because there was a wonderful basket of goodies in our room, I'm sorry, health treats in our room, just like I like, old time fresca, uh, health chocolates, uh, my goodness, the packages of uh, cranberries and so on, nuts. Really great. I appreciate that very, very much. I also want to make mention that uh, I enjoyed the kids up here singing, but I couldn't tell who belonged to John and Renee, and it was difficult to tell who belonged to Tim and Louisa back there. My goodness, I, uh, I had real trouble up here. Uh, brothers and sisters, if they ever do anything wrong, you're going to get the blame because they look like you. You know, facial recognition that's coming into view. I also want to praise the Lord for Marcia being here with me today. We were in Colorado a couple of three weeks ago. A miracle happened up there. Um, as you know, I'm always one to be home. But the miracle was a day early, Marcia got up in the morning and spoke to me about going home a day early. And on the way home, I noticed another miracle. She only mentioned there's a restaurant about 110 times. <laughs> I want to thank the pastor for inviting me back, and I praise the Lord to see the progress at the work here. And I trust that you'll go with me right into the message, please, in Mark chapter number 10. I have a lengthy passage that I want to read, and then I want to go back and try to take some things of special note. And so I'm going to begin my reading in Mark chapter number 10 and verse number 19. I hope that you'll follow along silently as I read aloud. Beginning in verse number 17, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, and sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about, and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel's. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessings upon the message this morning. 
and that Jesus Christ might be glorified. As I said in Sunday school, I'm glad to have my son and his family here with us today. Son, would you please stand and lead us to the throne of grace and prayer. Thank you. Now let's go back to the beginning of this reading this morning and take some things of special note. First of all, I note in verse number 17, the setting. And when he was gone forth into the way. Now that should be compared to the next page, verse number 32. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them and they were amazed and as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. Therefore, when I see in verse number 7, and when he was gone forth into the way, I'm automatically referenced to the last part of the life of Jesus Christ before he went to the cross. He was going to the cross. He was in the way. And that was the way of the cross that, as the song says, leads home. When he was gone forth into the way. So please try to grab hold of the setting for just a moment. Jesus had basically had his three years of ministry. He is now funneling to the work he came to do, that of shedding his blood on the cross, that we might have forgiveness of sins, be saved, and go to heaven. When he was gone forth into the way. And next I observe that there came one unto him. Matthew tells us and Luke tells us in their chapters that this was a rich young ruler. Here the Bible says there came one running running, mind you, as if to leave a sense of urgency. There came one running and kneeled to him and asked him. This fellow came to Jesus Christ in a, I'm going to say, way of humility, as it were. This fellow came to Jesus Christ in a way of respect, as it were. He came forth unto him and he knelt before him. And he said very diplomatically, a very kindly, good master. And at this point, I don't think he was joking. I don't think he was coming haughtily or to trick Jesus as the Pharisees and scribes were wont to do. But I think he is coming unto Jesus in a degree of sincerity and in truth. He came forth running and asked him, good master, Here's what I observe then. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? That phrase has a ring of an omen to me, so to speak. What must I do? What can I do? Interestingly enough, Matthew tells us in his chapter rendition of this story that he said, what good thing can I do? That has the distinct ring of works to it for salvation. He wanted eternal life. Now Mark amplifies that good thing to inherit. May I tax the thought process for just a moment? That has the ring to it, and some will disagree with it. It's all right, it's not a mountain I'm going to die on either. But that has the ring to it. Uh, <clears throat> I must be careful now. What, 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 can I do that I can put you obligated to me to have eternal life in heaven? That's the ring I get out of that. In other words, as with the probably 
great percentage of the thought process in mankind, he must be thinking he has to work his way to heaven. Uh, he's at this point saying, well, what can I do? Uh, I, I've got to be careful now. But what can I do? Uh, you know, I'm a pretty good fellow, as it is already. Uh, but I, I'm lacking in something. And Matthew tells us again, please, the young man said, what lack I yet? Now, Jesus is going to reference that in just a moment. But I get that putting it all together, that the young fellow is rich, he's a ruler, he's powerful, he's wealthy, uh, he's well-known, he's probably popular, and I, I think I detect a ring of, uh, of self-righteousness. If you don't yet, you will in just a moment. I think the guy is sincere. I think he senses his lack. That is a very true thing in every honest man and woman, boy and girl. A sense of lack. And I say that because of John chapter number 1 and verse number 9. That was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What is it talking about? Everybody comes with an inherent knowledge that there is a God and they're going to have an appointment with him one of these days down the road. Or again, I can cite Romans chapter number one. God hath showed it unto them by the creation of the world. Verses 18 and 19. Everybody comes with that knowledge. A lot of people try to reduce it to nothing. They try to squelch it. They try to camouflage it. But be that as it may, down inside the depths of the heart of mankind, if he's honest with himself, I believe he knows there's a God, and he knows God created this whole shebang. It didn't evolve. It was spoken into existence. Man didn't come out of a bunch of orangutans. He was spoken into existence. And different from all of the animals in that God breathed into him the breath, and he became a living soul. What do I have here then? We have this young man coming to Jesus, and he's saying, what can I do? May I put it this way this time, that I might buy eternal life. And going along with that is what I said a moment ago, that God is obligated to me. That God says, you know, old Joe down there, I hope there are no Joe, old Joes anyway around here today, but he, he's a good guy. I can't do without him. He deserves to come to heaven. There's not a person in this room, individually or collectively, who deserves to go to heaven. Frankly, even a saved person will admit he deserves to go to hell. After he's gotten saved. The only hitch is, once you get saved, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. And you are going to glorify God if he stays. Even if you do a poor job of it down here. One of these days you'll be glorifying the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, I see then that this guy is coming to the Lord and he says, What must I do? What can I do? What shall I do? The I, heavy on the eye, might inherit eternal life. And so Jesus tables that just a moment and he says, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. You have been in this church a long time and have heard me bring messages from this passage several times. Why callest thou me good? I would like to report today that I do not think Jesus was harsh with him when he said that. I think Jesus was looking at him in love and kindness, knowing that he was a soul for whom he was about to die at Calvary's cross. And... Rise again the third day. Why callest thou me good? How is it that you're calling me good? You know, friend, there's none good but one. That is God. Now it's important for us at this point to remember Jesus said that. There is none good but one, and that is God. And look at the writer with it. Jesus is not saying he's not good. We know scripturally that he was sinless. 
yet without sin, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him, I tell you. I find no fault in him. Pilate, sitting upon his so-called throne, said, Which of you convinceth me of sin? Why, they couldn't. They wanted it to be so, but it couldn't be done. Therefore, I submit Jesus was good and Jesus was God. If he was not good, he was not God. Ah, oh, one other thing in this area. Jesus was not God because he was good. Jesus was God and therefore good. He always was God, he always will be God. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. That's what it says. As I mentioned in Sunday school, I don't understand it all. But I love it. What I find and I do understand, I rejoice in. Because of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why callest thou me good? I hear a kind of pathos in that statement of Jesus. You, you know, there's none good but one, that is God. Are you saying that I am God? Now, I am saying he is God. Not was. He is and always will be and always was. I am, Jesus said. Do you remember that one? I am, hath sent thee, Moses. Before Abraham was, I am. Now, if you don't know what that means, ask a Jew. They knew what he meant by that. Clearly, the Bible reveals that to us. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Well, thou knowest the commandments. And then Jesus lists five that are readily recognizable. And for that sixth of that second table, if you were in Sunday school, he uses the word defraud. And as I mentioned then, coveting is the stepping block to fraud. And coveting also, by way of Colossians 3, 5, is idolatry. What does that mean? bring to our attention. It ought to ring a bell. Idolatry. Those that are called gods. Those that are man-made gods. I thought to myself when I was meditating upon this earlier this morning that really an idol is a god made by a man and therefore the idol is less than the man and therefore as man is wont to be and likes to be, his own God. No, he's not. Covetousness is the stem of idolatry. Then we have this going on. Jesus said, you know the commandments, keep them. And interestingly enough, this young man answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Now, I don't mean to be brash, and I certainly don't want to be unkind or rude, but he's lying. I do note that he said, I've observed these from my youth. Yeah, well, there's a difference in observing and fulfilling. All of these have I done from my youth. Oh, hey, come on. Why don't we be honest with ourselves? None of us have done it. If you were in Sunday school, I tried to lay the foundation for that statement. None of us have kept the commandments. We've all sinned and come short of the glory God demands to get into heaven. You're not going to make it. Period. We'll study that in a moment. Uh, I, all these have I done. Matthew says after that statement, what lack I yet? He sensed his need. He sensed he was lacking something. Ah, that ought to be the case of everyone. He answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I done or observed from my youth. Then one of the greatest statements in the Bible comes about. Then Jesus beholding him. You talk about a chance of a lifetime. 
you talk about a witness to a lost soul that was honest and pure and the best presentation there could be. Even if you don't understand why Jesus went this way, Jesus understood because he knew what was in man. He knew what that fellow needed. You talk about the opportunity passing Jesus beholding him. Don't you feel the compassion in that word? Jesus beholding him. Not just seeing him. Jesus beheld him. Not just looking at him, but Jesus was interested in that soul. Jesus had compassion on that soul. We're told the soul winners were supposed to love people. Our love is corrupted, by the way, because we're corrupted. Jesus loved that young man. Jesus beholding him. Now look at what it says next. Oh, praise the Lord. Loved him. I mean, God so loved the world, all inclusive. But that you can bring it down to your individual self is in that statement. Jesus loved him. And Jesus loves you today. As many might find this hard to believe, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. I have here our Lord and Savior on an individual basis. You say, well, how in the world can he deal with each one of us individually? He's got so much to do, he better get some help. You're forgetting. He's God. Amen. He's infinite. Right. It's nothing to him. Amen. He can be individual to every individual here and still be collectively God Almighty. Yes, and so we have Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, here it is, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come. Now let me stop. Here we get to that business of love thy neighbor as thyself. Here we get to some that every one of us know we're not going to be able to do. Here we get to something that is transitional, that is paramount in its importance. Jesus said, go and sell everything you have. Now, I submit that that's relative in a way. You may remember I read later on in this paragraph, two paragraphs, that Peter said, we have left all and followed thee. No, they hadn't. You say, brother pastor, how can you doubt the first pope's word? It's simple. Peter still had his fishing boat. And listen, you've got to remember this. Those disciples were businessmen. They were in the business of fishing, brothers and sisters. And those weren't just little boats that they had. Man, they were taking in the fish to sell at the market. Wholesalers, as it were. These men were some buddies in their business. He still had his fishing boat. He still had his abode. So that selling all is relative, not absolute. But I suggest we can't even keep it in relativity. If we're honest with ourselves, we know that we are sinners. Now here, what does he say? Jesus said, come, take up the cross and follow me. Now, for one thing, when Jesus said, follow me, he was either asking that young, rich ruler to break the first table of the commandments. Was he not? Unless Jesus was God. But since Jesus was God, he could do that. Now, keep in mind, please, the angels told people, don't worship me, worship God. Now Jesus is saying, follow me. What do we have here? In reality, we have Jesus again referring to his deity. 
Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Here, come, take up the cross, follow me. Oh, what do you think of this? Jesus did not say, take up thy cross. Jesus said, take up the cross. I've already tried to lay the setting of this from later on in the chapter where Jesus was in the way to Jerusalem. The cross was in the way, but the resurrection was also the victory. And so what do we have? Again, a reference to Jesus being God. Follow me. And he was sad at that saying, that's what got him. Now, if he'd have stuck around, he'd realized he was not going to be the loser, right? How many of you would rather get lost who are here and saved today? A guy would be crazy. As I've said before from this very pulpit, how rich are you folks? You're not rich? You're poverty stricken? Well, the church of Smyrna was said by God, I, I know thy poverty but thou art rich. He also told the Laodiceans, you say you're rich and you don't know that you're busted in every area. You're not rich? Are you saved? How much would you take for your salvation, Brother Brian? How about a million bucks? Cash, American greenbacks. A billion? Well, you must be rich, brother. In assets. You must have Jesus as your Savior. Now, if the guy would have just realized that, he would have realized something else. No man hath left all and followed me, but that he shall receive a hundredfold, both in this life. Now, that's what it says. Now, don't go out of here and start claiming the stuff and naming it as our pastor down in Houston is want to say sometimes, name it and claim it. Ah, 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 wait. I'm talking about the true riches. Who shall give unto you the true riches? There's only one who can do that. Now, what do we have then? This young man went away. He'd rather had what he had and lose it someday rather than take what he could get and never lose it. I want to say this, as I've said before. If we got saved and the Lord told us, now don't bother me anymore. You're on your own. I'm going to take you to heaven. But I don't want you bothering me anymore. Now, he didn't say that. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor in our heavy life. Let us come, therefore, boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter number four. But what if the Lord were to say to us, now I've saved you. I'm going to take you to heaven when you die. But you're going to have to fend for yourself down there now. I've, I've got more important stuff to do. And let's just say you had a poverty-stricken life by man's standard down here. Maybe kind of like Lazarus and the rich man ring a bell. Paradise versus hell. He'd have rather had what this world has to offer than what the Lord had to offer. And I say that very carefully because Jesus did say, come, take up the cross. There's a great involvement in that statement that we don't have time to get to. But I would like to suggest that in that involvement is the work of Jesus Christ at Calvary in our behalf. His shed blood, his taking our sins upon him, that we might be able to have justification and sanctification. What do we have here? The young man went away. Isn't that sad? 
If you stop to think about it, you got to kind of feel sorry for that young man. He's placing his eggs in the wrong basket. He's going to ultimately be the loser, not the winner. The young man goes away, and he grieved. I find grief must come about by wanting to hang on to both sides. It couldn't be. He was grieved. Oh boy, I'd like to have what Jesus has to offer, but not that bad. Sad. He went away grieved. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, verse 23, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished. Now, reading between the lines, knowing what the Bible teaches about salvation, you ought to be able to see something here when it says the disciples were astonished. Oh, Lord, hey, what's going on? Now, the Lord recognized that, and so Jesus was explaining it to him. Children, how hard it is for them that look at it, and this is the reasoning that is pivotal, they that trust in riches. Trusting in riches. A lot of people are trusting in their baptism. A lot of people are trusting in their church membership. A lot of people are trusting in their good works. A lot of people are trusting in their good looks. Let me caution you about that. <laughs> a lot of people are, are, well, I've witnessed to people, and they'll say, I'm not so bad. You know what they're saying? They're not so good. It's like Jesus. What do you think of this? When Jesus said there is none good but one, that is God, you know what he was telling that rich young ruler? You're a sinner in need of salvation by the grace of God. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Forget, brother, what you can do to buy your way into heaven. You're not going to be able to do it. The only way you can do it is by the free justification found in Jesus Christ our Lord. He died on the cross for our sin. God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5. Now the disciples are a little bit astonished at what, what's going on here. So Jesus goes ahead and tells them, hey, they're trusting in riches. They're trusting in something other than Jesus Christ. And listen, folks, it's plus nothing, minus nothing. You might as well get used to the fact, and I want to be careful when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. You're a dirty, low-down sinner. So am I. Ah, but be careful. Don't take that as license to sin. Whom he loveth, he chasteneth. <laughs> if there's no chastening, you're not sons. And so what do we have here? Jesus said, how do they that trust in riches? You've got to trust Christ and his finished work at Calvary for salvation. Now Jesus said in verse number 25 to amplify it, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now I see my time has already passed. Uh, so I'm going to have to quit with this. But I trust it'll get the whole point across. As a kid growing up, of course, my dad was a preacher. As a kid growing up, this always got me. Man, you can't put a camel through a needle's eye. And a lot of people have watered that down. I've read in commentaries that what that's referring to is an open spot, a small open spot in the wall of the city. And in order for a camel to go through it, he had to get down on his knees and crawl through it. I've even said that before myself. And I got to wonder, but it says a camel through a needle's eye. And that's what it means. I looked it up in Greek, finally. And, and study. I know just enough Greek to be dangerous, brother. But <clears throat> that word, I, 
is directly associated with sewing. S-E-W-I-N-G. It's not talking about a, a hole in the wall that a camel can get through. Ah, uh -uh. There's no way you're going to do it yourself. Jesus is saying, and by the way, this was a proverb in the Jewish world, I've learned. Well, uh, David, you're just as likely to climb Mount Everest as putting a camel through a needle's eye. They would use it as an exaggeration. Jesus is using it as an impossibility. That word I means a needle's eye. Yeah, I'm willing to grant that the needles may have been a little bit bigger back then. I mean, maybe the thread wasn't so fine. But let, let's take a needle about that long with an eye about that big in it that you could put a piece of leather through if it were small enough. Uh-uh. A camel's not going through that. And so the disciples asked, well, Lord, who then can be saved? And that statement is given in a negative fashion. It's a, what they're saying, and don't miss this, Lord, nobody can be saved, and they're including themselves. And yet Peter said later, we've left all and followed thee. That's not the key to getting it. The key is Jesus is God. And what did Jesus say? I said, Lord, who then can be saved? And Jesus, if I can put it in Burkholder terms, well, you can't. That's just the problem. You cannot get saved on your own or even partially on your own. You can't do it. Jesus said with man, didn't he? It is impossible. But with God, but with God, but with God, all things are possible. What do we have here then? Jesus said, why are you calling me thou good? Are you saying that I am God? Take up the cross and follow me. I submit the entire plan of salvation is in that phrase. Take up the cross and follow me. He's claiming deity. And then what did he say? Lord, who then can be saved? Well, you can't. With man. And you being a man. Or mankind, that includes the women. <laughs> I don't want to get caught leaving the women out. They tell Congress on me. You can't. You can't. Oh, Lord, we have no hope then. Well, with man, it's impossible. But with God, you can get saved and go to heaven when you die. Now, everybody in this room who's saved needs to rejoice and be glad in that because we're poverty-stricken in ourselves. But in Jesus Christ, we can have the riches of glory. And not only that, but if you're here not saved today. Jesus is beholding you. Yes, you individually. And Jesus loves you. He knows all about you. He's got every hair on your head and face numbered. He knows all about that sinful thought process. Sinful actions, sinful heart. And do you realize that he loves you anyway? You say, well, Brother Burkholder, you don't know how bad I am. That's probably true. You don't know how bad I am either. <laughs> Jesus knows how bad you are. Now you take Rahab, that heart. She got in on the plane. You take Uriah, the Hittite. He was outside the chosen, but he got in on the plane. 
You take a tei. He got in on the plan. You take David. Me. I got in on the plan. I hope you have, but if not, you can today. Brother, God bless you.